2006, and he is our CEO and founder, um, uh, along with Sandy Albi, who is our president and chief compliance officer. Um, Vid Designs is headquartered in Huntsville, Alabama, but as Jody mentioned, um, I'm located right here in the Tri-Cities, um, and we support government contractors of all sizes um, in all locations all over the country. So uh, we're excited to present to you today. And so with that, I will turn it over to Brent and Sandy, and I believe they'll, they'll start off with um, some questions for our audience. Thanks, Ashley. Can you guys hear me, Ashley? Yep, we can. Thank you. Uh, all right. And Lisa, Thanks, Ashley. Slide, I just please. want to make sure that you can hear me as well. Yep, we can. Thanks, Sandy. Okay, perfect. Thanks, Sandy. And I don't see the slides moving yet. Okay, next slide. There, I just wanted to see my picture. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> there's a <laughs> Brent Paris is me, and Sandy Albi is our senior partner, president, and chief compliance officer. Um, we don't have a picture of Ashley, but I uh, hope that a lot of you guys have seen Ashley before. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we've got a pretty exciting series for you. Um, I've been doing proposals since 1997. I've attended a lot of training. I started a company doing proposals. What I like to give people are the real um, tricks and tools of doing this in a realistic world and making it easy and somewhat enjoyable. And so I know a lot of times you could go to training and get a lot of textbook stuff that's really hard to apply. We're going to cut through that and give you just a whole lot of things that you can apply immediately and really kind of get real about uh, what goes on in, um, in proposal work. And to get started with that, um, what, what I'd like to do, what we usually do in a traditional setting, uh, I've been to Kennewick before or Tri-Cities and uh, did this session uh, for a class and we usually like to meet everybody and go around the room and hear a little bit about you and what your experience is in proposals and what you're looking for out of this session just helps us frame the message and hear a little bit from you. And during the course, we like to hear from you. So I think Lisa will give you some instructions on asking questions uh, via chat. Uh, but Lisa, how can everybody kind of give us an initial uh, overview of what they, where they are in proposals or are they brand new or looking for ways to do it better or um, also what they're looking out, looking to get out of the session? Okay. Thank you so much. I believe we're going to call out a name and then you were able to unmute. And when you do unmute, we would love to know if you are new to proposal writing and what would you like to get out of today? Those two things. So I'm gonna start with Candace. Candace, if you can unmute and let us all know. Um, well, I'm new to writing proposals in like a federal RFP area. I've been doing it for about four years and more, you know, just smaller business to business kind of thing. Um, so for me today, I'm just trying to just get a better understanding of the process and, and maybe learn some key things to make it um, less scary and daunting process. Hey, yeah. Sure we can deliver have, have you, have you done any yet, Can Candace? Not for the government, no. Um, I did one more recently that was probably a lot more similar to how those look in terms of having to, um, you know, for an agency that does a lot of government work. Um, but um, this, I haven't actually done any for the government. So this would, this would be a first. Okay, thank you. All right, you can mute, thank you. Uh, Katina. Please unmute and let us know, are you new to this or you've been doing this for a while? And if you have been doing this, how many proposals? Um, I've been doing this for a while, actually. My very first proposal was for the Port of Seattle, um, for the International Airport, and it took me months to write and we ended up getting that job. But <clears throat> we, I've been doing proposal writing for two years and um, I'm really looking to get a little bit more knowledge on this side because the RFP is for like the Port of Seattle, that kind of stuff I can handle, but the more smaller, I don't know how to explain it, not really RFPs, but RFQs 
are a little bit more, the way they have them set up, they're not as easy to, to read and write for what they want. So I'm hoping to pull some type of knowledge from this for that, but also whatever knowledge I can, you know, take in for just regular RFP writing would help it out drastically. I've got three of them sitting on my desk right now I'm working on, so. Excellent, okay. Thank you. We're gonna go on to Grant, please unmute. And let us know um, your experience level and how many proposals and what you wanna know. Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be uh, with the group today. Uh, pretty much a novice uh, when it comes to this. Uh, just a little bit of background spectrum reach where the uh, multimedia marketing arm of Charter Communications, better known as the cable company. And uh, in recent years, we've developed uh, a lot of new products advanced media products. And as a result, we've, we've been doing some business with some various government agencies um, as far as advertising, marketing, uh, that type of thing, have, have done a couple, two or three RFPs, uh, but just trying to gain more information, trying to find out more about this process, trying to find out where, where we possibly fit in, either as a uh, individual uh, bidder on these, or perhaps maybe how we could partner with other uh, business entities uh, to form a coalition to to try to win some of these bids. So, just really trying to trying to learn more than anything. Excellent. Thank you so much, Grant. All right, we're going to move on to Joseph. Yes, hello, everyone. Uh, so I'm brand new to this, uh, never done any RFPs, and I'm just trying to get a foundational understanding for my new job. Okay, excellent. This will be an interesting three days for you, for sure. Uh, Justin, or Justine. Hello, it is Justine. I'm also 100% new to this and just wanting to get a better understanding of what to do. Okay, great. Okay, Laura, tell us a little bit. Hey, um, well, I've actually been at this for some time, um, probably a little over 20 years off and on. Um, so I've, I've done quite a few government proposals, but uh, it's, it's a much heavier government workload where I'm at now. So um, just, just looking to get some pointers and, and see, you know, if, if uh, there are any areas where I can improve. Outstanding. Laura, what's your, what's your position in doing proposals? A proposal manager. Okay. And you've done it how long? Uh, a little over 20 years. Oh, okay. So I'll be calling on you during the class for some questions oh. and answers. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <Here> to work. <laughs> Laura, right. got it. Laura, I put a star by your name too, Laura. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> uh, Nina. Hi, good morning. My name is Nina LaFrance and I'm with Port Madison Enterprises in Coastal, Washington. Um, I have had a background in uh, proposal writing for IDIQ contracts. But we are now starting a sister company and we're gonna be doing more design build. And I think that um, this course is gonna be really beneficial to me. I'm learning how to put something together for the bigger type projects. Okay, thank you, Nina. Yeah. All right, let's go on to Richard. Uh, I'm from Western Restaurant Supply and Design. I'm actually <laughs> trying to learn how to um, bid out some of these larger contracts for these kitchens. Um, I actually just finished a larger contract for Pacific Northwest Laboratories on a government project and I'm just trying to get more involved into more of them. Okay, perfect. Ryan. Ryan, you get to unmute. It's in the left bottom corner of your screen. Okay. And that may be, that may be Rianne. Oh, Rianne. Okay. Rianne. She is unmuted. 
All right. You may be having difficulties. I'm going to move on to Trina and we'll come back to Rianne. Very good. Yeah. Hi, I'm Trina. I'm a PTAC counselor also with Jody and Lisa. I'm here um, just to look at the content and see if it's um, uh, if I have some points that I can recommend uh, to, I don't know if it's being, oh, it is being recorded. So um, my experience as an entrepreneur, I went to the 8 day program for nine years. I wrote all of our proposals and I grew my business to uh, be successful uh, uh, in multi-million dollars a year revenue, so. Mm -hmm. Outstanding, Trina. I'm Thanks. so glad you're a PTAC counselor. <laughs> Thanks so much. <laughs> I am. All right, I think that's our list. We can go back to Rianne, give her a sec. Okay, that was a sec. We'll, we'll let, um, Brent, take it away. It's all you. All right. Well, it's great to hear from everybody. Um, got got a pretty good um, understanding of where this group is, and you're in luck because our our session is designed to kind of start from the beginning and give you a big picture of the uh, federal acquisition process. It will apply to you know state and local because uh, there's a lot of similarities. Um, but let's start. Uh, kind of with the big picture. One thing I noted, I wrote down, um, several people mentioned proposal writing. Um, and so let's start with that and kind of just take a step back, uh, especially to some of you that are new. And my friend Laura, my new friend Laura can help confirm some of this. Um, you know, looking at uh, if it's your new job or you're breaking into this, um, this area, um we we look at it and it's anytime it's something new especially something that seems complicated you don't really know where to start what to do with all this information how to how to put something together and, and win it um so let's just take a, a step and uh, back and look at the big picture um if you're going to do any kind of proposal whether that's commercial or state and local regardless of the kind of service or product you're offering uh, you want to win it all right you want to win it and grow your business um that's the goal how we do that um takes takes some you know dissecting and understanding especially with federal rfps any rfp request for a proposal or request for quote um, is is going to come out with a set of instructions on what goes in the in the proposal and it's gonna come out with a set of instructions or a set of evaluation criteria and how you'll be evaluated. So uh, kind of our around the room initial thought and question we always ask is what does it take to win a proposal and what does it take to lose a proposal? So uh, one thing everyone that has in common, pretty much without exception, and if they win a proposal, they had the highest evaluation scores of anyone else. So that's a really good starting point, especially if you're new to it. What is the evaluation criteria? What does it say? What does it tell me uh, that I need to do to get the highest possible points or scores to win this proposal? That's where you start. Then you need the instructions uh, from the RFP to tell you how to put it together. And that's where the word compliance comes in. You could have the highest level scores and the best solution or product or offering, but if you miss on compliance, you could and probably will be thrown out on non-compliance, meaning you didn't give them what they asked for. And it makes sense because you're going to have evaluators. Uh, they're looking at everybody's proposal and they need to see the same thing from everybody. So if you happen to be the one proposer that's missing a section that was required, they couldn't give you a score for it whereas you might have the otherwise best possible solution. And it's really heartbreaking to do so much work and get the right solution only to have missed something in compliance. So you've got two key challenges when you begin any proposal, whether you're new or been doing it for 20 years like Laura, as I'm sure Laura would agree. I hey, gotta Brent. find the best way, yes. Can I just add a couple of things in here? Cause you said a couple of, of really, really valuable things. And I just thought maybe that I would add um, a couple of things yes. um, to the folks that are listening in 
um, you know, you started off and, you know, what you're seeing on your screens right now is, is what does it take to, to win a proposal? And, you know, by you saying, you know, everyone has the highest evaluation scores, I want everyone to think about that for a minute because you hear a lot of things in government contracting about P win and making sure that you're responding to all the requirements in you know, the technical proposal, whether that be a statement of work or a performance work statement or you know, whoever your customer might be, whether that be um, Department of Energy, Department of Defense, you know, any federal agency, any state agency, any local agency. Um, I want you all to really think about when you're working on a proposal the important thing is to maximize the evaluation scores. And so as we go through the training over the next three days, I want you all to think about that as kind of our, our groundwork um, from, from where we're going to be. And we're gonna talk a whole lot about compliance. And so Brent is just starting to set the stage there. I won't add anything about that right now. Um, but I do want everyone to just think about, um, you know, when it comes to what does it take to win a proposal and, and proposal responses, Yes, you've got to write, you've got to know what you're doing, you've got a price to win, you know, you've got to do all those things. But the ultimate goal is to maximize those evaluation scores. And so I just really wanted to underscore that as we all just kind of get started together and kind of establish the messaging um, over the next few days. So that's right. And the, you know, the end result of these questions is exactly that. What does it take to win a proposal? You've got to be compliant and have the highest evaluation score. What does it take to lose a proposal? You don't have the highest evaluation score or you're not compliant. Okay, Lisa, we're ready for the next slide. Um, for anybody that has ever been a part of a process, um, Laura, you might appreciate this one more. Some of you that are just starting might get real scared, but there's some humor built into this slide. I would say I've been around a long time. We've been in business 15 years with bid designs. I've been around hundreds of government contractors. I'd say 90% of them do it this way. So let's go through a proposal process that you don't want to, to do. Um, you know, get started. Um, someone finds an RFP and everybody gets excited about it and they say, let's do it. And let's kick it off. And what are we going to do? And we've got to start writing. Because remember, we talked in the beginning where everybody's going to start writing. Uh, it takes about a day or two, maybe three, for someone to say, what do we write? And we're going to start reviewing it. And someone's going to say, what's going on with this thing? We, we really got to win this. We we want it. It's good dollar value. It's our work. What, what's happening here? And someone else will say, well, maybe this is a must win. And then we get a little bit further into the proposal all this back and forth and no one, you know, is really on the same page. And ultimately we decide we really can't bid this, but then we think, well, we've gone 20 days. We've put something into it. We might as well finish it. Maybe we'll learn something. Maybe we'll win it. Then we redo the entire proposal. And if you've ever been around proposals or have heard about them, you'll hear about late nights and people working all night long usually happens around here where the whole proposal in the first 20 days of a 30 day term, um, uh, everything's being done for the first time, really. We realize we don't even have the right solution. We might have to team with someone or do something else and we're figuring it out. Um, then, you know, uh, pre COVID, there was a lot of uh, printing of proposals and uh, had to realize that printing a proposal is not as easy as hitting print. Uh, it takes a lot to do that. And then we just turn it in. We hope for the best. Everybody takes a vacation and a deep breather. And then we have a lessons learned meeting to see what we could do in the future, maybe attend some PTAC training and uh, make sure this never happens again, yet we never really resolve anything. Laura, did we hit on anything familiar here? Yeah. <laughs> um, fortunately, that's not really the case where I'm at now, but yes, I have gone through this process Good. before and um, fortunately, the, the, the days of printing multiple copies of proposals with tabs and everything else that goes yeah. along with it are, are long gone. Um, it's It's been quite a few years since I've had to do one like that, so I'm definitely liking the, the electronic submission, but yeah, I don't. I don't miss sure. the late night runs to the airport to take the the package to FedEx. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's right. That's exactly right. 
<laughs> okay, and next slide, we're going to kind of give you the other side of how you I want to. She was saying these. she does not work in that environment anymore. There, there is a I different know. way, and and even if you're not printing proposals, it, it still gets pretty intense. Um, and and do know that there are places that have um, very thoughtful procedural based ways um, that don't require overnights. Believe it or not, um, when you've got a proposal due. Right. So more of a logical way going from red to green, uh, progressive versus the other slide. We want to put some check marks in place in a, in, a, in a process that makes sense. We find it, we might have some criteria for um, deciding a, what we call a bid or no bid decision. <clears throat> if it meets everybody's, <clears throat> excuse me, criteria. Uh, the first key that a lot of people miss, and we'll talk about it a lot more tomorrow, Cindy's going to lead an entire compliance session tomorrow, um, is developing a compliance matrix. And that's putting together all of the requirements of the RFP and the evaluation criteria and determining how to outline it. Um, that's a masterpiece of document you always want to have. You don't ever want to do any kind of proposal without one. Um, from there, you can build a wind map. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. And we'll um, from there do uh, a hold. Hang on a second. Get away from this phone. Hold the kickoff. And um, from there, we kind of start doing the whole solution development, writing, and then we'll do some uh, reviews. So that's a, and you know, quality and compliance check along the way. I'm sure you guys have heard of color reviews and red team and gold team reviews and things like that. Um, those are your stop points to really make sure that everybody's looking at number one, the solution and that you are compliant and um, on the right track to producing a winning proposal. Those last few days of any proposal, whether it's um, electronic or printed are very critical um, that you're not still writing and putting things together the day it's due. And the reason is, is you can't really take a step back and number one, make sure that everything is compliant and number two, um, make sure that your solution is sound. So you always want to have time in your in your schedule, which you need one, um, to make sure that you've got time to really sit back and quality check, solution check, check against the evaluation criteria. Um, so that's what's really the overall process that we'll be talking to and kind of framing this. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that win map. Um, it's a term that I coined a phrase um, of really putting together what needs to go in this before you even do any writing makes writing a whole lot easier. A lot of people think, you know, I just need a proposal writer and just start writing. And they find that, well, I need a little more than that. Um, I need to know what to write, which means I need to know what the solution or the product is. And it's often two different things. Um, it can be the same thing, but um, kind of got to really uh, divide that out. Um, next slide, please. All right, next. So when we get started, and again, we're taking it from the baseline and um, moving forward uh, from that. Um, and in, you know, today we're talking about federal um, federal contracts primarily is the topic. Um, you know, everything in the federal government. There's a lot of rules. Uh, there's a lot of ways that the government buys, and it's all determined in the federal acquisition regulation, the FAR, which we'll reference. Um, there's a lot of opinions out there on the best way to develop a proposal. There's a lot of different people that have a lot of different ideas. Uh, and one thing that's really difficult about proposals, and it's certainly difficult in training um, and application is, you know, one RFP can look a lot different than another one. Uh, but we're gonna give you some tips to, to help make that a little bit cleaner so that you can apply it to a wide variety of different types, whether it's an RFP, an RFQ, and they can all be structured in a lot of different ways. The good news. Uh, like we talked about in the beginning, when you can start any RFP and never forget, uh, whether it's your first one or your hundredth one, I got to go to the evaluation criteria first, right? I got to see what it is that I need to do to get the highest scores. And I need to get 100% compliance with the RFP instructions. That is going to set you on the right course. Your compliance matrix is going to do that for you. When you do that right, we're going to give you some training and tips on how to do that. Um, your compliance matrix, therefore, is your starting point in making sure that you're, you're marrying up both the evaluation criteria 
and the uh, instruction. It doesn't really stop there because you want to make sure that you're writing or putting together solutions to that matrix and that you're reviewing uh, to make sure that you're actually hitting the right scores and the, and the right um, instructions. Not as difficult as it might sound. So we're just being real here, like we said in the beginning. Daunting, challenging, a little confusing? Yeah, absolutely. Easy to dissect? I think so, when you realize two important things. There's evaluation criteria and instruction. If you get a hold of an RFP that doesn't have evaluation instructions or um, evaluation criteria or, or instructions, then you've got some missing pieces. You should never propose on an RFP that doesn't have instructions or evaluation criteria, ever. Um, so you'll need to stop and go to someone and find out what's going on. Yeah, I think that's a good note, um, Brent, especially for people um, who may not have done this process before. Um, it is always okay, and we'll talk about this in detail as well. Um, it is always okay to ask questions. Um, you might not get the answer yeah. you were looking for. You might not get the answer at all. Um, but don't let that deter you from asking questions. Every RFP should have some sort of instructions. Um, it may be a paragraph. Um, it may be 100 pages of instructions or more. Um, and there always needs to be evaluation factors because there's no way that you can maximize those scores uh, without knowing how your proposal is going to be evaluated. So for those of you who are especially are, are subcontractors or, co or contracting commercially um, or for state or, or local RFPs, um, sometimes uh, they're not as mature. And so we do want to make sure that the RFP is complete. Um, and it's always great to go ahead and talk through, um, you know, hey, is this thing complete? Do we have evaluation factors in here? Um, and it's always okay to ask those questions and we have those conversations a whole lot. And there's all, all different types of contracting offices. Uh, you've got DOD with their branches and then you've got civilian agencies and um, you have different contracting mechanism within all those agencies, different levels of skills, putting these acquisitions together. Um, it, it, you know, it's, unless you're focused on one agency and um, understand how they're buying, it's really difficult to, you know, try to think you can uh, see the same thing uh, across a multitude of different ones. But these similarities are what we're focusing on that you want to keep in mind. Um, okay, next slide. Sandy, you want to take this one for them? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so this one uh, is just talking through, and these are for those of you that do federal uh, government contracting. And again, I encourage you guys to ask questions. Um, tell us about the types of RFPs that you all are interested in bidding, and we can certainly tailor the comments, um, you know, towards those. Uh, we see all different types of RFPs. Ashley can certainly uh, attest to that. Um, I know uh, Department of Energy and their large subs are of particular interest uh, in the area um, of the PTAC. That's, that's hosting us this afternoon and or this morning, um, and we appreciate that. Um, but it's important to know that um, the federal, at the federal level, um, the acquisition process is governed. Um, and most of you probably know that it is governed by the federal acquisition regulation. Um, and this information is just general information that's provided um, uh, by the federal government. Um, a good place to start looking for opportunities is a website called beta.sam.gov. Um, it's actually about to be updated here. Um, pretty shortly. And so if you're not familiar with it, you'll want to um, definitely make yourself familiar with it, create yourself an account, look around there. Um, your, your agency um, will list uh, opportunities there. Um, but overall, this is just telling us that these um, federal opportunities are rooted in uh, the law and that it comes down through the federal acquisition regulation different agencies um, have different agency requirements. And so there are uh, federal acquisition regulation supplements. Um, for example, if you've heard of the DFARS, that's simply the Department of Defense uh, federal acquisition regulation supplements um, and other agencies have their own supplements as well. Um, so if you've never um, done government contracting before, definitely contact Jody at the PTAC and she'll help you understand what you need to know um, with regards to obtaining DUNS numbers and creating a record in SAM and 
talk to you about representations and certifications and things like that. Um, that stuff is kind of outside of the purview of this particular training. Um, but as you know, and as you'll learn, the deeper you get into government contracting, it's all very well um, intertwined. And there are certain things that you have to do to qualify in order to bid. Um, so it's always a good idea to kind of do some background research. Why are we doing what we're doing? Where did the rules come from? Um, and this is just a little bit of background on that. Thanks, Sandy. Sure. Next slide, please, Lisa. I think the next slide gives us a, additionally a little bit more information. Um, most opportunities um, are listed on beta.sam.gov. Um, there are some that are not. Those are set asides or uh, other, uh, th th there's lots of different rules and requirements about what is and what isn't posted on um, beta.sam.gov. But for the most part, um, you can think of that as your place to start uh, to look for opportunities and to pay attention to it. Um, because once your uh, opportunity comes out or your, your request for proposal that you're interested in bidding on, it's very likely that there'll be updates or changes along the way. Um, and those will be made in uh, the form of amendments. And so you want to pay attention, bookmark those sites and make sure that you're going back and understanding what the requirements are and how they change along the way. Um, hey, it Sandy. Does yes. Sandy, this is Jody. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but Laura has a question for sure. you guys right now. Can we have her ask her Absolutely. question? Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I was just wondering, um, I guess a couple of years ago now, we had gotten a uh, notification, I guess it was a news article that uh, they were going to be doing away with DUNS and replacing it. Yes. With a system called SAMI. Are they still doing that? I haven't heard any more about so, it. I think that's still happening, but I just read in the last week or so that they are delaying it. So I okay. thought that the DUNS were going away and it was going to be imminent, um, but it, the, the contract, and I think the contract is with Dun & Bradstreet. Um, it's one mm -hmm. of the rare long running contracts. Um, I think the government um, realized what a wrench that would throw into um, you know, all the changes and updates that were required. Um, I'm not sure why they delayed it, but for the last I read was that I think they delayed it for another two years, if I'm not mistaken. And I'll try to look that up. Okay, um, yeah, because I think the last update. I saw they were going to try to have it in place by the end of either 2019 or 2020. I forget which. Right. But. Yeah, I'm I'm pretty sure that that they delayed it for two years, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, in what I read recently. Um, but yeah, that's a really good question. You know, these things get updated. Um, uh, it, it is it is true. Um, I, Dun and Bradstreet does have the the contract to assign Dun's numbers and things like that. And you know, just like any other contract um, with the government, it does have an end date. Um, and mm -hmm. you know, they'll have to recompete or or go in a different direction or do whatever the government wants to do. Um, and that's just one of those items. Good question. Okay. Thanks. Sure. So I think that's it in terms of this overview. Um, just know that you know everything is, is rooted in uh, the federal acquisition regulation. There is a great deal of background information on how and why uh, the system is set up the way that it is. Um, it's certainly not perfect as anyone that has worked a government proposal can tell you. Um, but I can tell you having worked on the government side as well as on the, the contractor side um, previously in my career, um, I would say, you know, the, the vast, vast majority of folks that you're going to work with, um, you know, on the government side and, of course, on the contractor side as well, everyone is trying to adhere to the rules and the regulations and everyone wants the system to work well um, so that ultimately, um, you know, the country can benefit from the work that the government is doing. And that gets into, you know, this all gets into a lot. Obviously, we're talking about um, federal contracts and being a prime contractor. Yeah. Um, and there's different sizes. So you might be a prime contractor for a very small effort, or you might, you know, you know, if you're uh, ever, and we see these sometimes our clients will be a subcontractor to Boeing and Boeing is the one that either has the contractor is uh, bidding on one of these larger ones and Boeing will put out their own RFP. And it's kind of the same thing because they flow down a lot of requirement and they do kind of the same thing. And I'm talking Boeing specifically because they will put out an RFP that has instructions and evaluation criteria. 
And you need to apply these same principles to even uh, some like that when you might happen to be a subcontractor uh, proposing to be a part of a, a larger company. But yes, this is pretty much for the uh, federal um, um, prime contractors. Next, please. This is just kind of an overview. And again, we're kind of taking a step back for some of you guys that's new to this. What really happens uh, in the, um, generally speaking, the acquisition process from the government standpoint, um, all of the contracting officers will basically, they're required to set what they call an acquisition strategy. And an acquisition strategy is how they're going to buy. Uh, there's different ways they can, which means your RFP may look different depending on which way they choose. Um, from dollar values, type of services and products and things like that. But one thing they have to do is establish the, um, basically the set aside. Can it be a small business set aside, a socioeconomic, you know, an 8A, a hub zone or something like that. Um, and they do that via market research. And market research is, um, is primarily done in new procurements. You might see something called an RFI, request for information. And it's very important that you always submit that, that, and that basically shows that you can do the work, that small businesses are able and available um, to promote the set-aside designation uh, for other than large business. You will not win uh, if you submit an RFI. If you see those sources, thought, requests for information, uh, those are not things that are competitively evaluated. Just by turning in one, you will not uh, win. Uh, you will not even really be evaluated. They're just looking to see if you're um, stating that your size business can do the work. So it is important that you do them, but just keep that in mind. They will then define their acquisition strategy. That's a whole course on its own. We won't cover that a lot of here today. Uh, very often you'll see something called an industry day where they'll meet with uh, people and you'll see the, all the people from the government side uh, can ask questions. Those are important to go to, you know, virtually. Um, a lot of times you'll see a draft request for proposal, and uh, that is basically when the government releases some instructions and evaluation criteria or the performance work statement or the scope of work. Um, and they really do that for a variety of reasons. Sometimes it's a really good chance for you to get started and ask questions, and usually it's because they're still developing the requirements. At some point along the lines, they'll issue what we call a final RFP, final request for proposal with a due date. Um, and those due dates can vary for purposes of this class. We'll talk usually about a 30 day pretty standard uh, turn for a proposal it can be 15 days, depending on the type could be 45 days. You see them kind of all over the board, but 30 days is a good average to talk to. When you turn a proposal in, it's going to go to source selection. There's a source selection evaluation board. This is where some of the agency differences can come in, but basically usually there's assigned people to look at everything that uh, has come in from all the all the proposers um, and they'll look at they'll be assigned section evaluators are usually i'm talking generally how it works are assigned sections to review and they have scoring sheets and so they'll go through it and assign scores based on the evaluation criteria and the proposal instructions and they'll read and assess and give you scores they'll tally all the scores and see how everybody did Therefore, that's another key point to the beginning charts here. Uh, you got to imagine being an evaluator looking at five different proposals, one section, and you've got one outlier that did not follow the instructions. Very difficult for that evaluator to give that one um, good scores. So always want to make it easy for the evaluator to find what he or she has got to score and put it right front and center. And they're going to score by evaluation criteria every time. From there, a variety of things can happen. They can ask for revisions or send out what that some agencies will call evaluation notices. And uh, finally, someone will win the contract. Next, please. It's, again, we're framing some of this stuff. All right, this is my favorite slide. And, um, and I'll tell you a story of why it is. It was like a lot of you in this class when I did my first proposal, 1997. Um, I did not know what I was doing at all. And I was brought in to this big room of people. I was assigned a technical volume to lead it. No idea what that meant, had no training. Um, and they handed me this big RFP, thick, thick, thick pieces of paper. 
one of the biggest binder clips I've ever seen. And they uh, had us in this big conference room and they said, okay, go ahead and um, get started. And this is a must win and uh, read every word of the RFP, you know? And I did because I did what I was told to do. And I had never been so confused in, in my entire life. Um, I couldn't make sense of anything really. I had no idea what I was doing, none. And I really struggled and stressed over it. Eventually, some people were kind enough to help lead the way, but it was really a terrible thing to go through. What I uh, realized later, much later, um, was um, there's a, any, any RFP, and this is key. This is one of the second key things you want to get out of this session. Uh, the first one being the compliance and the evaluation criteria. Key thing number three, anytime you get an RFP from the government, it's literally going to be the, um, the all those terms and conditions, all those words that you know what to do with, it's going to be the contract uh, that your company is going to have if you were to win it. Now, we're going to take this example here because this is a very standard example. Uh, you see a lot of these. Not all RFPs are set up this way, but they're derivatives of this. Uh, FAR Part 15 acquisition establishes what we call a uniform contract format. Um, and you'll see a lot of RFPs that follow this. And it has all these different sections. And as you can just read the titles of them, you can see that it's got all this kind of stuff. And you're just wondering, what, what do I need for the proposal? To write the proposal, to develop the proposal. Well, we've highlighted the things in red that are going to be of most interest to you. Um, and, you know, your, again, your RFP is going to be a contract document. It's going to have down there at the bottom section L and M, proposal instructions and evaluation criteria. So we're going to use those terms generally um, throughout this training section L and M. Will you have an RFP that doesn't have a section L and M and isn't scheduled, you know, laid out this way? Absolutely. Um, but just keep in mind, that's just because of the differences in buying. This is kind of the standard. Everything else is kind of a, a mix of this. But the, the basics is you want to look for something called proposal instructions and evaluation criteria and, of course, scope of work or performance work statement, um, any special contract requirements that you may need to address. All this other stuff, you want your contracts people to review and make sure that your company can sign up for effectively these terms and conditions. Most RFPs, most proposals that you turn in, unless you take exceptions to anything in these other sections, you're basically saying we will um, conform to these requirements when we turn in our proposal. Sandy, you want to say anything about that? Yeah, just uh, you you covered that really, um, really thoroughly. So this comes, you know, of course, from the uniform contract format from the federal acquisition regulation um, that I mentioned a, a few slides ago. Um, you are right, not every RFP will have a section A through M. Um, they won't always have an SF-33. If it's a commercial uh, buy, it might have an SF-1449 if you're in the uh, construction or research fields. Um, it may be a completely different document. Um, the bottom line is that you're always looking for the instructions. You're looking for the evaluation criteria. And you also need to make sure, we didn't talk about the sizes of different businesses that are represented here um, for those of you listening in on the training, but um, it's important, even if you are a one person startup, um, you need to make sure that you are reading um, the entire RFP. If you're in a little bit of a larger organization, you'll also have the person responsible for your contract administration also reading the entire RFP, kind of those sections there in green, um, just to make sure that all of the requirements can be adhered to, um, as Brent had mentioned. Um, it's just important to note that the entire RFP needs to be read, needs to be analyzed before uh, you respond to the RFP, because by returning a um, response to a solicitation, you are confirming that you can meet all of the provisions, all of the requirements that are listed. Um, and sometimes there's what we call hidden requirements um, within a solicitation. And um, we'll talk about those as, as we move on um, just a little bit. Um, and we talk about building compliance matrices and things like that that are gonna help us uncover those. Um, but really it's important that you take the time to read the entire RFP. I know it sounds silly, 
um, but you'd be shocked at the number of folks that we work with um, who don't see specific sections, um, you know, because they're so busy focusing on, you know, only looking at section M, um, you know, which is, of course, is critical, um, but you do need to, at some point, make sure that somebody within your organization is responsible for reading the entire RFP um, so that you're grabbing the, the important parts. Thank you, Sandy. Sure. I know a lot of times when people see that slide and hear what we just said, <laughs> It's when people say, no, thank you. <laughs> this is too much. I don't even know exactly what you just said. Brett and so, I are kind of the, I, the crazy people that, that <laughs> find these fun. I, it's just, it's like a giant puzzle that, that wants to be uh, read and, and, and dissected. And of course, it's always fun to work with the technical folks. We work with people in a lot of different industries. So we get to learn about very technical things. Um, in a wide range of, of services and, and goods that, that our clients provide. Um, but this is just part of that puzzle and, and part of dissecting that. Um, I have a similar story to Brent when I started working uh, in, in government contracts. Uh, I started working in contracts, um, not necessarily as a proposal manager, but as a contract manager. Um, and at that time I was handed a, a, a half billion dollar contract and said, here, monitor this. Um, and, and same situation, you know, it had a section A through uh, J at that point, um, once it was already a contract, um, but I uh, had to work through it and, and learn all of the different things. Um, and so don't be intimidated and don't be afraid to ask questions. Absolutely ask the questions when you need to. Yeah. And, you know, just keep in mind, don't, don't let it, don't let it scare you. Um, look for your proposal instructions and evaluation criteria. Jody, I'm sure the PTAC can help navigate some of these things when RFPs come up. <clears throat> I think that's what you guys help your clients do a lot. Um, so I think there's always resources and ways to you know, assist you if you, if you don't necessarily have those at, at hand, but don't let it scare you away. You wanna bid, you wanna do this. Okay, that's very next. true. And we do have uh, some members of our PTAC team here in Washington that really, really enjoy um, you know, helping people dissect these and, and work through them. So we've got a great team of support all the way through the state and beyond. Thank you. Awesome. Next, please. Um, some of the best advice I ever got. And, and we're talking, you know, in the beginning, a few people said writing the proposal. There's a lot of writing sometimes. Sometimes you might be proposing a product or, a, you know, delivery and Maybe the writing is a little less essential because you're just providing what it is you're going to provide with a cost, uh, depending. But we use the word writing and we got to write anything. Um, it really is a proposal. So if anyone's proposing something to you, and this is the point where I miss doing things in person right now, because uh, we'll do a little scenario around the room and uh, they're kind of fun to do. But um, really, I'll just kind of tell you, you know, if someone was proposing to you and you had a company and you were sending out an RFP and you wanted someone to bid on you, uh, uh, bid on your, your, your effort, um, you would be looking for some key things. So just for a moment, put yourself in those shoes um, and, you know, whatever it may be, something you do and something you know. Um, sometimes I use the uh, analogy of lawn care or an apartment complex just because I think that's something people can get their arms around. And you'll see that a little bit in the example a little bit later. Um, but if someone's coming to you and they want to do this work for you and they're writing something and, and you're going to evaluate everybody, number one, you'd like to know that they understand what it is you're buying, right? You don't want to just see someone that's randomly saying, this is what we do. You've never heard of them. Uh, you've probably got to try harder uh, if they've never heard of you. And that means starting with a really basic, this is, um, and, and right now, don't worry so much about where this goes in our proposal. We'll cover that later. But right now, you want to, you know, just kind of think big picture. Um, you want to make sure they understand that you understand the work and what to be done and what the nuances are and what the critical success factors are. A lot of times, if you tell someone, this is what you need to be looking for, this is what's important about this work really going to resound with an evaluator. Wow, they really know what they're doing. 
And then again, for when you're writing technical approaches and things like that, you want to be sure that you lay out specifically how you're going to do the work. This can vary, uh, you know, based on the instructions and evaluation criteria, of course, again, big picture. Um, you want to talk about how you're going to do the work. After you do that, you want to sell it. And you've probably heard some of these terms before. You want to really explain to them, you know, what are some of those key features, strengths, and benefits? And you always want some proofs. Uh, whatever you say and lay claim to in a proposal, you want to be able to back it up. You never want to say things like we are the best or you know, no one else can do it as well as we can. You need to prove that. You need to provide some evidence and some basics of that. This is a really good way to think about laying out a written proposal. You know, it's really just something that's going to be um, something that real people can read and go, they really know this. They know this work, they know what we're buying, they have a clear approach and they've sold it well. And they've told me how this is gonna benefit me. So again, if you're the buyer and someone lays out something like this to you, um, you're gonna give it a lot more attention that they've really spent the time to say, I understand you what you need, here's what I do, here's how it's gonna help you and here's how I can prove that I've done it in the past. And you're gonna be like, wow, this is really good. Versus someone that proposed to you and just light out, here's what we're going to do and here's how much it costs. Yeah, well, you know, depending on what it is, um, that may be appropriate at times, but for sure, mostly when we're doing these government contracts, you're going to have to go in this direction. Um, you know, know your proposal volumes. There's often a technical volume. There's often a management volume. There's often a past experience or past performance volume. There's often a cost volume. These are different volumes uh, of an RFP that are required to be written, assembled, put together, whatever term you want to use, um, and they're going to each be evaluated, usually by a different evaluator, usually. Very seldom that you would find the same evaluator looking at all your volumes, which is important because you don't want to assume that something in one volume was read by an evaluator in another volume. All right, so we're still on big picture. What is a proposal? It is something that is um, showing what you're proposing and what your solution is and why it's beneficial in the big picture. Hey Brent, this is Jody. I wanna ask a quick question because I've had, um, I've had a couple of clients that really uh, marketed themselves to PTAC as being able to do anything for anyone, any time and anywhere. But, hmm. uh, you know, just as if I wanted somebody to put a roof on my house, I, I personally don't think I'd listen to someone that said that they need to clarify exactly what they do, prove they've had that experience, that they can do it within a time frame, within a specific cost parameters. Um, what is your recommendation for those that try to market so strongly? Are they helping or are they hindering when they attempt to do that when speaking with a proc procurement professional? Um, well, I, I wouldn't want to, um, you know, answer that in a, in a way that would um, you know, prohibit anyone. I, you know, I think you're, you're at a, you're at a business perspective at that point in a strategy, uh, probably more than a proposal response, but, you know, I think it's, I learned early on and I learned it in my own business too, by the way. Um, it, it, and it's very rare to find someone that is everything to everyone. Right. Mm -hmm. So I took a turn in my business about five years in. So about 10 years ago now, um, and we were kind of that full up anything we can do in proposals. And we really narrowed down to this is what we do. This is what we're best at. Um, and we focus on that as our niche item. And that's what we build all our processes and procedures around. That's mm -hmm. kind of my general answer to that. I think that's kind of hard to answer for everybody in every situation. But that's mm -hmm. more of a business angle, I think, you know, especially with some of your small business owners. Um, I know there's an eagerness to, we can do that, we can do that, we can do that. And it really depends on the type of work if you're doing staffing mm -hmm. services or a product and solution. I mean, it all really uh, kind of depends, but mm -hmm. yeah. Well, and again, it depends on what the, what that entity, that government entity is looking for and, and having an understanding that the procurement mm -hmm. professional cannot pick and choose because someone uses some specific terms. They, they must go with uh, the policies and procedures they have with regard to writing the solicitations and that's why it's so important isn't mm. it, to really look through exactly what that solicitation says. And sometimes less is more focus on what they're asking versus what you wish they knew. 
Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's really good. Might make it so easier give them for what them. they're asking for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Give them what they're asking for. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Number one. Yeah, I, I also think that as you are becoming more experienced in responding to proposals, um, notice I didn't just say writing, responding is a whole process. Um, with thinking mm -hmm. about this, what you see on the slide right now, understanding approach, features and benefits, proof points, you want to start developing what um, companies call a proposal library um, that has these different items that you can use and that you can pull from. And as you do that, and as you respond to things and get feedback and win work and develop new partnerships, you really start to develop who and where you are as a company and the things that you are going to be most successful at when it comes to bidding and winning work. So when you're first starting out, you know, you might try to that approach of, you know, anything, anywhere, um, as you had mentioned, Jody. Um, <clears throat> but then from there, um, you really want to become known for what it is that you do and what it is that you do well and starting to establish a proposal library where you can refer back to things that you've done before and proof points that you've developed, because these things can take a whole lot of time. Um, it will help you in the long run as you develop um, and become more mature as a company. Excellent, yeah. excellent points, thank you. And on that point, in session three, we're gonna talk a little bit more about marketing to the government, what that means, how you do that. Uh, that's, that's also a territory, a little bit outside proposal development, but I like to cover it because everyone has that question. Um, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that too. Okay, next please. Uh, again, from our previous slide, breaking this down to the bare bones, um, we refer to it as section L based on that chart we gave you. And we will share the slides later. I think I saw someone ask a question. We certainly will. Um, but whether it's section L or equivalent, as you'll note at the top, find your proposal instructions first. Here's a sample. Uh, some in proposal instructions from a real RFP. You can see it's got some general instructions. It's got due dates at the top. Um, there's an SF-1449. It gave you a breakdown of the different volumes, what the page counts are, what goes in the proposal under the sub factors. That means very clearly on just these two pages, you've got to provide all of that. That's for your compliance matrix, which we'll show you more detail on. It's going to be very handy. So find your instructions first, it's what goes in the proposal. And it's what Jody just said, give them exactly what they're looking for. Do not ever put in a proposal that has 18 pages of upfront narrative about you because it's probably not gonna be looked at. Start off with exactly in the order they put here, what they wanna see. Very hard for some people to do that. Next, please. And as we've talked about several times, look for your evaluation criteria. And this is some samples of evaluation criteria. These also need to go side by side in your compliance matrix. So we're gonna match them up. Uh, that's what Bid Designs does. We're a compliance company um, and we're gonna show you how tomorrow. Um, we could always help you too, but it um, doesn't matter. You wanna do a compliance matrix. You wanna match up your evaluation with your instructions. Um, the evaluation is gonna say, um, exactly. This is what we're going to look at. Look down here on the left, subfactor one management plan. The government will evaluate the proposed management plan to ensure offer has demonstrated an understanding of the work to be performed, including competent and thorough knowledge of the requirements as stated in the PWF. You know, and then it goes on and on, and you're like, wow, I've got to nail that. Um, so your evaluation is going to lead you to your solution, to your offering. You may have one, you're definitely going to have to shape it and sell it to fit what they're looking for. That's what you put in a proposal, the instructions and the evaluation criteria. Once you turn it in, um, the evaluation criteria will tell the evaluators how the, um, that's going to be their scoring checklist. You always want to put things in the order that the evaluator will do it. So you'll often see factors and sub factors and things like that. Always follow that and make sure that it's 
very clear. What can happen there is a variety of things depending on the acquisition method selected. Uh, you could get, you know, ratings like, uh, like you'll see here on the right. Uh, this particular one is uh, the technical risk rating is going to be outstanding or good. Um, proposal indicates an exceptional approach or good. Proposal indicates a thorough approach. You know, some of those words are definitely subjective and open to interpretation, but guess what? You're proposing to people. People. People are the ones that are reading this, interpreting these words. There's a wide variety of people out there and what they look at and how they interpret things. And for past performance, you know, they've, in this case, they're going to look at very relevant, relevant, somewhat relevant, not relevant at all. Um, so they always give you this kind of stuff. You want to really spend your time assessing that and determining what your solution is going to look like to get the highest scores. So let's take a moment here, and this is a little bit uh, going in depth, but I want to um, hit on it for just a moment. Uh, if you were going to get an outstanding rating on your technical risk section, in this particular case, they want to see an outstanding, uh, an exceptional approach, and your requirements contain multiple strengths and uh, risk of performance is low. Notice below it says to get a good rating, you have at least one strength. So you know what I would do? In my technical section, I'd have a call out box that had strengths as my title and list as many as I could. See, that's just one example of how you want to look at this evaluation criteria and structure how you're going to present this uh, to the government in a compliant manner. So this is it's a great example for training. Hmm, I'm going to get the highest score for multiple strengths. Not so good a score for at least one strength. I better have multiple strengths and I better call it out so they see them. Next, please. You hear this, you don't want this to happen. Uh, we follow, who is it, Sandy and Ashley? Coprints, is that who we follow? I'm sure everyone knows about Coprints. Yeah. Um, they publish a lot of things on LinkedIn about um, protests and how government contractors lose. Uh, there was a protest not long ago because, uh, and this is, this is great for training, bad for the company, um, but, um, the, uh, the company had a great proposal. They had great scores in all their sections. They did not follow the instructions for the table of contents, and they were dismissed for noncompliance. And there was a protest, and they still lost. And it was, you know, heartbreaking, I'm sure. Heartbreaking being the light word. I'm sure it was just awful. Um, but that's what happened. So, yeah, you can be thrown out for being non-compliant, even with the um, best possible solution. Compliance is key. You are not thrown out if they don't like your input. So let's just say in a you know, big picture, they wanted to see a resume of a program manager or a project manager, and they didn't like the resume, but they met all of the, they didn't think the experience was deep enough for their liking or whatever. Um, you were compliant because you put in the resume and you checked all the boxes, but they didn't like the level of experience. So they scored it lower. That would be, that would not be a case of compliance. That would be a case of a lower score. Um, so it's always important to kind of keep that in mind of, um, yeah, I can be thrown out. Uh, and that gets into strategy. Uh, you want to be compliant first, but um, a lot, I've seen companies, they'll, for instance, maybe not have the experience to get the highest scores, but they're going to make up for, for higher scores and technical and hope for the best. There's trade-offs, and that's okay, too. That's just decisions you have to make is, well, I know we're not going to get the best score here. I hope to make up for it here and see how this washes out. All kinds of strategies like that happen every day. Yeah, Brent, that's very just one people. thing that I – oh, sorry. No, I was just going to say very few people get the highest possible score in every category. You know, it's really right. about the total. Right. And and this is a thing to think about, you know, proposals are, a, a, you know, require the effort of the entire company. And it's important to have the right people reviewing the different instances and elements of the proposal, um, because, you know, it is entirely possible to have a completely, you know, compliant proposal 
um, where you know they might not like it. And, and in government contracting terms, they'll call it technically non-responsive. Um, it doesn't mean that anyone did anything wrong. It meant that the government didn't like your solution. Um, and so it's really important to distinguish between the two and to make sure that everybody that has a stake in the RFP response participates in the proposal process. Um, you know, because you do need to make sure that you're compliant, you need to make sure that the time is provided to make sure that you're double and triple checking the proposal to make sure that it is compliant. And then of course you need to have the technical folks put in their input uh, and, you know, make sure that the solutioning is as best as it can be and demonstrates an understanding of the government customer. So just something to note here, it, it's really important to, to differentiate between the two and to have those conversations um, within your organization. Mm -hmm. That's right. Next, please, Lisa. Sandy, you wanna handle this one? Yeah, absolutely. This is your area, you do <laughs> yeah. a lot of these. Yeah, so it's, it's very exciting. Um, when you have an opportunity to uh, come back after your proposal has gone through its initial evaluation, and this doesn't happen in, in every instance, um, you know, it, it might not be a, a services proposal, you might sell uh, items that supplies contracting, you know, a, a physical object, whatever that might be, um, or you might uh, be under a different sort of, of solicitation um, where price is the most important factor or, or different things like that. Um, but when you're working on a, a services proposal um, that is normally a best value uh, type of evaluation, um, a lot of times the government likes to go back um, once they have um, done an initial review of proposals, um, they develop what they call the competitive range, which is the group of down selected offerers who um, they might want some additional information from. And they might issue you an evaluation notice or a discussion notice, depending on, on what they might call it. Um, when you make that competitive range, that's a good thing. Um, you have the opportunity to either answer questions that they might have and or to provide to them a complete final proposal revision or an update with regards to all of that information. So um, it's really good when it happens. You definitely want to stop what you're doing the moment you receive one of those because the turnaround time is usually very quick. Um, you do want to make sure that you're addressing the things that the government is pointing out as a weakness um, or other item to be addressed within your proposal. Be careful about changing things that the government didn't mention. Um, if they didn't mention yeah. it, it's probably a good thing. Um, and so you don't want to get too wrapped up in going back to things that you think that you could have improved upon. You don't want to call attention to yourself from an area that was not of concern um, to the government evaluator or evaluation team. Um, and we can talk, you know, you guys have questions about discussion um, notices or items or the negotiation phase or anything like that. Um, you know, if you've got any specific questions, we can talk about that. But bottom line here is just to note that when you do have the opportunity to update or change your proposal, it's usually because you've met the, the competitive range. Um, unfortunately, if you do turn in a non-compliant proposal, the government and the contracting office is well within uh, its ability to tell you, you know, you missed something here um, and either throw out your whole proposal. They might throw out a portion of the proposal um, resulting in a technically unacceptable evaluation. They might pull pages off of the end if you didn't quite get your page numbering right. Um, there's a lot of different things that the government can do. And a lot of that is up to the discretion of a particular contracting office or particular contracting officer um, individually. So um, a lot of different things at play here. Make sure you're going back and reading that RFP so that you understand what's going to happen once you turn it in and be aware of any opportunities that you might have. Um, we had a case of, of one client, it's kind of fun to, you know, kind of talk about things that have happened in the past. Um, one client turned in a proposal and, and on the cover sheet, it turned out um, to be an, an incorrect phone number um, as a POC um, contact person for, for the proposal. Um, it wasn't a, a just straight out wrong number. It was a number that was connected to the company, but it, was, it wasn't assigned to anybody. Um, and so um, our client got a hold of the um, person responsible for the phone lines 
and uh, they went ahead and uh, converted that phone number to his phone number throughout the source selection process so that the government was able to get a hold of him. Um, but you just have to pay close attention to all those different details. Um, you do want to make sure um, that you are reachable and that you're really paying close attention. I've also heard another um, story of a client um, who um, they turned in a proposal and then the person responsible for the proposal left the company and nobody was monitoring that person's email. Um, and so, you know, you want to make sure that you're not getting into those situations, that you're really paying close attention and that you make yourself available um, when these items come up. Because again, quick turnarounds and you want to show that you're eager and willing um, to respond when the government is asking. All right. So um, I think we'll cover just a couple of slides here. Um, Lisa, I know I'm watching the clock here too. Let me see what's next. Yeah, Brent, this is Jody. I know we had this scheduled to go to 1130. So we wanted to be sure that we're yeah. able to wrap up as close to that and get everything out there to yeah. them as possible. Thank you. Yeah, let me see what this one after this is. This may be where you start tomorrow, Sandy. Let me look. Yeah. I think so. One more, please. Yes. Sandy, um, so we'll kind of wrap up here, start wrapping up, and I'd like to entertain any questions so far. Um, let me just give you a, a brief synopsis. We can go back, Lisa, to that final uh, part two introduction. Sandy, we'll cover these tomorrow in our compliance session. And one thing, um, Brent, if we have a moment, um, and I can do this tomorrow as well, um, I'd love to know from the people that are listening in, um, who are your customers? What types of RFPs um, are you looking at responding to? I want to make sure that we're covering things of interest and of use um, to the folks that are listening in. Yeah, I think that would be really good for everybody to uh, bring with them uh, tomorrow. So um, we'll, we'll kind of wrap it here. I just want to do a, a quick recap of what we've done today. Uh, number one, if you've seen enough to make you not ever want to do this again, don't let that happen. And I will tell you one thing that's already occurred for everybody on this session, especially if you're new to this, um, you already probably know more about proposals than people that do them every day and have done them, many people we see every day. Um, it's about dissecting it and getting real about it, knowing what you're dealing with. Um, understanding there's complexities, but not letting that deter you. Um, it's, it's actually pretty exciting to be able to put this together and tackle it. Um, you know, keep in mind what we said at the top of this show is um, it's all about the instructions and evaluation criteria. Always look for that. Where that goes from there uh, gets into what you're offering. You got to know what you're offering. You got to know how to put it together. Uh, you got to know what you're looking at. And if you don't know, find someone that does. Um, don't let that stop you either. You're always going to be able to figure it out, whether it's the PTAC or uh, someone in your company. If your company's not that big, uh, there's different ways uh, to be able to figure out all those terms and conditions and the things that you may not know. Um, you don't have to know everything. You need to know that you're putting together a proposal that your company can do, and you're going to work your heart out to have the best solution, try to get the highest scores, um, and certainly be compliant in the process so that you're not thrown out. And sometimes just taking the evaluation and studying it, and, you know, talking with someone, or if it's just you, determining what's going to go in here, really thinking about it, uh, keeping in mind you're sending this into people uh, to get the highest scores possible. Um, so with that, Jody, uh, we could entertain any questions if we have any uh, so far today. I haven't seen any pop in. You did answer the question about whether or not we can share the slides. So we appreciate that. Um, who would like to, uh, anyone like to unmute and ask a question or raise your hand so we know that you would like to? This is a great time. Uh, we've got an additional 10 minutes or so for you folks to get some one on one guidance from our presenters today. Well, I wanted, this is Lisa, and I wanted to really. Nina raised her hand. I don't know. Nina raised that. her oh. hand. So. Hi, thank you. Um, I am wondering, uh, where does this training um, also cover the site walk or site visit? 
and the PPIs? I can take that one. Um, so we don't um, cover directly um, site visits. Um, what we cover specifically is going to be um, is going to be, you know, what's directly written into the RFP. So, you know, really we'll touch on that when we talk about creating compliance matrices, just, you know, for informational um, only. Um, but in terms of, you know, doing site walks and things like that, that's where you're gonna gather, you know, technical knowledge, take away um, any specific information that's provided to you um, that comes along with the briefings um, and, and things like that sort of on the, on the technical side. Um, and when you talk about, are you talk PPI, you're talking about past performance information? Oh, pre-proposal inquiries. Oh, like RFIs and sources thoughts and things like that? Uh, sure, yeah, because yeah. Um, I know that, um, you know, when you're putting in a proposal, you wanna make sure it's complete and you don't want to, well, not only over, I mean, put too much cost in there, assuming right. things and then, or underbid yourself. And then later, uh, you know, once the job's awarded, find that you didn't allow, you know, didn't put enough money in. So right. I, that's you know, where I was going with it. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about, you know, when to get started on proposals, drafts and things like that. Um, Q and A's, um, and you know we'll talk a, quite a bit about that because those are critical. Um, and so you know I want to say yes, um, but if I don't get specifically into you know what you're looking for or you know have specific questions on that, um, definitely bring that back up tomorrow, and I'd be happy to talk to it. Nina, what were you looking for specifically around site visits? Well, um, I suppose when. Um, you know, when you are, you, you receive an RFP and the site walk, um, it differs. There's some, there's some, maybe some changes. Mm. And um, I just want to know that uh, uh, about the amendments, I guess, how they come across and how we incorporate that into our proposal. Do we, do we actually specify the amendments that are, or the PPIs, uh, the answers to our, our questions is, are they incorporated into our proposal? Yeah. Yeah. Sandy will definitely handle that tomorrow in compliance with the amendments yeah. and all those things. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. I don't see another hand raised at the moment. Lisa, do you have a question? I didn't have a question, but it was more of a comment about looking at proposals and responses. PTAC does a fabulous job in assisting businesses in this particular yeah. avenue. I mean, we really do look and dissect and dig in and roll up the sleeves. And, and this has been a great presentation of an hour and a half. I learned some things as well. Um, so I just want to reiterate, obviously these folks know who PTEC is because this is a PTEC presentation, but know that early on, earlier the better to get with your PTAC to get it on our calendar so we can help and assist and guide um, is really an important thing. To know. Yeah, and that's a good point I wanted to mention. Tomorrow's compliance session is pretty much exactly the same session Sandy presented I guess to the nationwide PTAC counselors last year in, yes. um, okay. in March. Um, so all the attendees are gonna get that kind of insight here too. So it'll be a really great session tomorrow on compliance. Great. That will be excellent. Laura, so any, anyone else Laura, out that has a need, question for Brand or Sandy? We gotta hear from Laura to help us wrap up here. <laughs> True. <laughs> Uh, sure. What, what are you looking for? <laughs> Did we hit on some topics that are near and dear to your heart? You got any oh, uh, yes, absolutely. advice for our, our class? Um, okay. Yeah, I, I think we'll probably cover more of, of, of it tomorrow in um, right. uh, compliance. Um, just that, you know, you, you hit on these two sections and they're very important, but, but you mentioned earlier about it being like a puzzle. And it very much is so because a lot of times there will be proposal requirements embedded in the scope of work. So 
you know, you, you really have to dig in there and, and, and really dissect the thing to find everything that they're looking for, for the, in the response. Mm -hmm. And since you've done it about as long as we have, and you kind of heard the baseline here today, do you have any advice for our other classmates that are just starting? Um, well, honestly, I, <laughs> this is something that I wish I had had years ago. So I think this is a very good, a very good base, very good jumping off point if somebody's looking to get into this. Good. Okay, great. I wish I had it too. <laughs> so I understand that. Well, that's why well, we thank appreciate you, Laura. having everybody. people like you here. Um, we do have folks that, that have so many questions that some of the things we have the answers for and others, I've, I've actually reached out to Ashley and, you know, professionals yeah, like yourselves to provide some guidance if they are, um, if they're feeling like they really want to dive in and, and know, uh, you know, more in depth how to handle a specific RFP. Um, I'm never, I'm never shy to reach out <coughs> to people like you that we know for some guidance too. Absolutely. And there's so many things that can come up that are just, you know, I mean, I see something new all the time that I, I think I've seen everything. And then once in a while, I'll see something I'm like, wow, I can't believe I'm still seeing something I've never seen before. <laughs> but it does happen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think one yeah. of the questions well, that still you. comes to my mind are those uh, proposals that you see a due date that's only, you know, 10 to 14 days out. Um, that I think is another yeah. reason to point out, you mentioned earlier, I think Sandy mentioned earlier, have a library when you get started and you save these because there are pieces of those proposals that will be applicable, at least in part, mm -hmm. to additional RFPs. Um, so the, the bigger your library, the, the easier it gets over time, would you say? I, I would. I'm um, um, Libraries scare me a little bit, I think. There's a lot of things that um, uh, I hear, you know, I, I can hear people say, we wrote this proposal two years ago. And I'm like, well, is it the same instructions and evaluation criteria? Um, mm -hmm. You may have, but it might have been a totally different, um, you know, a library is good for keeping track of your statistics and your past performance, your exactly. accomplishments, and all those proof points you want in your proposal. I want to be clear on that. We highly advocate that. Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily advocate a proposal library of things I've written and just want to, I did such a, because people lose the fact that this is a new section l &M, And that's my, 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 my point of concern of just saying that uh, generally. So there's a you know qualifier there. Certainly mm -hmm. good to keep your um, statistics. The other thing is, is, you know, real world, which I'm all about, it's hard to do. Um, it is just hard discipline to do a really good job of keeping those statistics. You've really got to dedicate to it. Um, so mm -hmm. keep that in mind too. Good you point. might have a library that has some good stuff, but not everything's there because it was a good project for us to do for a month. Then we didn't do it again for a year. You know, mm -hmm. that's real world. That happens in anything that we do. Good intentions taken over by the, the, the work of the day. Mm -hmm. um, so keep, keep the real realness to it. Mm -hmm. Great advice. Thank you. So, Brent or Sandy, anything else in closing today um, before we head out and look forward to tomorrow's presentation? No, we look forward to tomorrow. It'll be just Sandy tomorrow doing all compliance. Anything you've ever thought of, talked about with your family and friends during vacations about compliance, we'll cover. <laughs> I know it's always I'm on your mind. a lot more fun than Brent is insinuating. <laughs> Most of the time. <laughs> Everything compliance is, is tomorrow. The third day is going to be wrapping up and talking more about solution and maximizing your evaluation scores and how to put all this together. So it's a great um, capstone on Thursday, which I'll be back joining us uh, for Thursday. But we really appreciate everybody's time. And if you have tomorrow that come up, please uh, start the session with them and we'll cover them. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you, Brent, Sandy, Ashley, and Lisa for helping me to, to keep the backstage files rolling so we're good to go. So everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. We'll end, uh, we'll end our webinar right now on that good note, and we'll see you again tomorrow at 10 o'clock. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Have everyone. a good day.
Well, thank you guys. That went well. I think it went well, Lisa. Thank you so much for the, the initial stages of making sure we got the screens and the sure. <laughs> entries and mutes and everything. And webinar is different. I, all my meetings are generally on meetings. So this is kind yeah. of new for me. So I appreciate your help. <laughs> you bet. And tomorrow I will not be able to be right there, but I think we worked out the kinks. Yeah. Um, one question I had is how people were entering this. Were you having to let them in? Were you distracted by that or did they just come in to the I had to on the attendee list, I had to uh click on allow allow to speak is the control I had to click in order to let them in. It didn't have Ooh. the enter thing, allow entry. That's weird. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Meetings you allow entry. Um I think we I think we figured it out tomorrow uh, for Ashley. I will probably hop on about quarter till instead of uh, nine thirty tomorrow. So if you want to hop on then, okay. Make sure we're all good to go. We're ready to rock. And Lisa, we'll see you about five or ten till. Eh? Sounds good. Okay, Ashley. Anything Bye. else for today? She's gone. <laughs> she's gone or muted. One of the two. I just oh. muted. <laughs> All righty. Well, thank you, ladies. You have a wonderful day. We'll see you tomorrow you. morning. Okay. Bye-bye. I think I still see you there, Ashley. Do you have any questions? <laughs>